Hello again. How are you? Hope things are going well for you. I wanted to talk with you today about exchange theory and three theorists that are covered under this topic. Exchange theory uh, you can think of as a, a basic way for humans to socially uh, interact through exchange. We've already discussed conflict theory and some of the same names uh, appear in both sections, uh, in particular the name of Randall Collins. He described some aspects of conflict and some aspects of exchange. And so you can ask yourself which kinds of things are fundamental for understanding human patterns of interaction? Are humans essentially in conflict with each other? Or are we in exchange relationships? Or do we go back and forth between these types of interactions? So to look at exchange we ought to begin by thinking about what it's linked to and what disciplines connect with exchange theory. It's very often connected with economics, trying to understand the behavior of people and how they decide to make exchanges. It's also linked to something we've talked about a little bit before, I believe, utilitarianism. Utilitarian was, utilitarianism was promoted by uh, a guy, Jeremy Bentham, and he was an Enlightenment thinker, a philosopher. And he came up with this notion that uh, people seek pleasure and avoid pain. Everyone is pretty much similar with this. I mean, there are some people who supposedly seek out pain, like through S&M, uh, they're into that type of thing, but in fact other people would say, well, actually they see pain as pleasure. So let's just stick with the idea of people seek pleasure and avoid pain as a general rule. And that this is what Bentham referred to as a, a utility calculus, where we actually weigh how much pleasure something is likely to bring us versus the pain or difficulties or problems it might cause us. My go-to example for this usually is eating. It tells you a little about me, but I'll think to myself, well, there's a donut. I would love to have that donut, but if I eat that donut, I might not fit in my pants anymore. I'd have to work out on the treadmill for you know, half an hour. Ugh, is it worth it? So that's a basic idea of utility calculus. Human beings do this in some ways all day long. And this exchange theory idea and Jeremy Bentham are both connected to the Enlightenment. Bentham was an Enlightenment thinker, or sometimes referred to as one of the philosophers. Um, and as a refresher, the Enlightenment was that intellectual movement in Western Europe, and it concerned several things, like, for example, how humans can be happy. Um, one of the things that was promoted in the idea of the United States as a, a new country was um, the freedom to uh, pursue happiness, not necessarily get happiness, uh, but to pursue the idea of it. And also, too, the Enlightenment promoted science and scientific calculation, measuring things, observing things. The modern era, we see the consumer revolution, the very uh, inexpensive reproduction of goods, their availability relatively cheap, and mass markets. We see a rise in secondary relationships. So these are relationships based on goals and calculating what you need to get from someone and how you can do that in a particular short-term relationship and then move on to your other secondary relationships. There's an emphasis on rationality. We saw that with Weber, legal rational calculations, bureaucracies, ways of trying to be efficient. And along with that, the development of capitalism, the strengthening of capitalism and it growing as a dominant economic force in the modern era. So exchange theory links together a lot of stuff. And one thing that it also does is it promotes what you could call the micro-macro link. Kenneth Allen explains that in the past the theorists we've already considered really did not look at the link between 
micro-level individual behavior and macro-level structures. The theorists just explain the macro-level structures without thinking much about the individual behavior. Exchange theory brings them both kind of together and links them. So it's this idea of how are face-to-face -face interactions, our everyday interactions, and social structure interconnected. And to make that point, we engage in exchanges every day, right? So how are those things essential to our social order? These are really good questions to become the basis for a new type of theorizing. George Holmans is the first of these theorists here, and he's unique in this discussion of social theory in this uh, Kenneth Allen book and in other uh, sources because he was not trained in sociology. His degree was in English literature, and uh, he is accepted or adopted by sociology because of a lot of his work. Uh, he taught at Harvard and was the author of many books, and so uh, a very important figure in this particular area of exchange theory. It's important to think about Holman's as someone interested in behavioral psychology. The individual thought and how that links to an individual's behavior. And in doing that kind of theorizing, Holman's is it's useful to draw from some of the previous uh, work in behavioral psychology to get Holman's points. So most of you are probably familiar from Intro to Psychology with Pavlov and the idea of respondent conditioning. Respondent conditioning means that you've got, say for example, a dog who salivates when it smells or sees meat, and then a researcher pairs meat with the ring of a bell. The dog begins to associate those two things together so that when the meat is withdrawn and the bell rings by itself, the dog begins salivating. So this is a starting point for trying to understand people's behavior. The source of automatic behaviors is genetic. If I hit my knee with a mallet and my leg flies up, this is an indicator of um, this kind of conditioning that we already have biologically that can then be made paired up in association with other things. Okay. That was uh, Pavlov's contribution. B.F. Skinner developed what was called operant conditioning. And operant conditioning means that we learn operations because some things are connected with rewards and others with punishment. So in his example, what Skinner did was he would have rats in cages and if they were to press a bar, they would receive a food pellet. So they do an operation, they get a reward. He also had situations where there was an arbitrary line in the cage, which was uh, electrified. If the rat would cross the line, it would receive a shock. So the rat learns, don't cross this line, this punishment comes. So people, as I say here, learn based on consequences and rewards. They do things that are rewarded, they avoid things that are punished. So you can see how this relates to Bentham's utility calculus that we just discussed. Holman said that human beings are unique because we can link together long chains of stimulus response patterns. What does that mean? That we are different than other species because we can think abstractly and make plans. So what I'd like you to do for just a second Think maybe of five things that you did today based on long chains. And here's just a starting point to think about. Uh, you could say coming to class today, I guess, or in this instance, this isn't necessarily coming to class, but watching this video. Uh, what is that linked to in your long set of possible goals and ideas about the future? Maybe you're watching this in order to complete a class, and that will help you complete a degree, which will then in turn 
help you to get a job, which will allow you to own your own home someday. So there's four ways that you can see an everyday behavior linked to something else and larger chains. Uh, you can think about all kinds of other things. Uh, if I speed while I'm on the road, I might get a speeding ticket. That might mean I have less money, which would mean I can't afford school. You see where this is going. Animals don't do this. So Holman's is very prescient to point this out. He comes up with these three propositions that are nice and useful to consider. Uh, they're propositions like general rules, if you will. One of them is this success proposition. If you have different behaviors you can choose from, you're most likely to choose what's consistently rewarded. And that makes intuitive sense. If you regularly get the reward for doing selection A, but it's irregular for B and C, you figure that out eventually and you go to A. That's going to be your preference. The value proposition. Highly rewarded, I'm sorry, highly valued rewards uh, means greater likelihood the person's going to perform the action. So if, for example, you, know, you might get something that's very valuable from doing a behavior, that will mean that will influence your doing that behavior. Again, simple principle, but important to note about human action. And these two things, the success proposition, the value proposition, come together in what Holmans calls the rationality principle. We aim for uh, doing things in line with both the success proposition and the value proposition, but what Holmans notes is these uh, combinations, these, this way of thinking about things, really is only good in the moment. So what's funny, and I know you know this too, is that what's a good idea today might not necessarily seem to be a good idea two years from now. Uh, we have to, you know, think through these things, but it's difficult. Um, if, for example, I decide I want to you know, rollerblade today if it makes me feel good and uh, I, I feel like I get good energy from it and it's something that you know connects well with what I want to do, sure, I'll do it. If I have a huge accident, yikes, uh, that might mean that two years from now I really regret that decision. So here's the funny thing that all this comes down to. Rationality is a normative concept. And what does that mean? That means that we think about it differently. It's not something that's hard and fast set in stone. It depends on what you value. Um, there is no rationality that everyone will necessarily agree on, but it becomes a system of Order, ordering what you think you want or desire or whatnot uh, that may vary quite a bit and changes. So you can think maybe capital R rationality really doesn't exist. It's normative. It's something that it depends on what you want to think or like. There's a few fun ideas too that he has at the toward the end of um, this very brief discussion in your textbook. Uh, one of them, the deprivation satiation proposition. It says here, um, if a person's actions uh, if a person's actions are rewarded past a certain threshold, subsequent rewards become less and less valuable, the frequency of the behavior goes down. And the fun example that Alan gives in the textbook is uh, a husband comes home and gives his wife or partner flowers. And this partner is really happy says, wow, this is such a loving, generous gesture, and this is so neat, and it gives him a charge. They're really happy. But if he does this every day for two weeks, eventually it's going to lose its potency. And so therefore, um, this idea of if you haven't received something for a while, it's valued, deprivation. But if 
you receive too much of it, you get satiated. Once you get satiated, you don't really want it anymore. Think about it this way. If someone gives you a chocolate chip cookie, that might be, well, that's really great. If they give you a chocolate chip cookie over and over and over again, you eventually say, you know what? You keep those. I'm, I'm done. Right? That's the deprivation satiation proposition. The frustration aggression proposition is connected with this true. It says uh, here that if a person doesn't receive the response that he or she is thinking or receives a punishment, um, so doesn't receive a reward, instead receives a punishment when they're expecting a reward, then that person is going to become angry and frustrated. Our next theorist, Peter Blau, was born in Vienna, Austria. And you can see from the date of his life that he was born at the end of World War I, but grew up and then uh, watched his parents, who were secular Jews, face discrimination. Uh, Austria was annexed by Germany in the Anschluss, uh, which was the ramping up toward World War II. Uh, and lucky enough for Peter Blau, he was able to immigrate to the United States, became a U.S. citizen in 1943, and he served in World War II and fought uh, with the U.S. Army, so served his country. And after that, graduated from Columbia University in 1952 and went on to be a professor at several prestigious universities in the United States and also a very prolific writer, writing many, many articles, dozens of articles and even uh, publishing 11 books, an amazing amount in his lifetime. One of the things uh, I'd like you to know, you can take note of, Holman's, the theorist we just discussed, was more focused on the behavioral dynamics of the individual. So that's why he's focused really on psychological type things, so psychology and behavior of the individual. Blau is concerned with the social exchange relation itself. Right. So this is an important difference between those two theorists. One point that Blau makes is a focus on the difference between economic exchange versus social exchange. That these are different animals, if you will. And just to check with you on your reading, I'll ask you some questions right now. Which of these has the terms spelled out in advance? Economic relationships or social relationships? The economic relationships are usually spelled out pretty clearly, right? The terms of a social relationship emerge as the relationship emerges, right? That sort of answers the second question. Which one tends to develop slowly? You can have a very quick exchange based on money, buying something or selling something, but social exchanges take time, and so they require the building of trust, right? You say hello to someone, they say hello back. If you say hello to them one day and they don't respond to you, you may not trust them and you may not be building up a relationship. Which are meaningful? Here's the thing. Economic exchanges are not necessarily meaningful at all. You can have economic exchanges, for example, with people you don't even know. On the other hand, social exchanges have meaning within them. You can receive an email from someone a world away that can touch you, that can make you feel strong feelings. Right? Finally, which of these economic or social exchanges have benefits that are more detached from the source. Interestingly enough, money is completely detached from the source. Okay, So this is something that becomes um, universal for exchange and really doesn't matter in some ways uh, who the money comes from. Money is money, right? So the bottom line from that section of your text, social exchanges create diffuse social obligations and not so much calculable. You can't say 
to someone, for example, okay, now I had you dinner over for dinner tonight, so that means that you're going to come help me mow my lawn on Tuesday. You know, social exchanges don't really work that way. Another nice observation Blau makes is that some relationships have more balance than other relationships. Have you ever had, for example, someone who wanted to be friends with you more than you wanted to be friends with them? It creates an imbalance in the relationship. And probably you've also had the reverse experience. You wanted to be friends with someone who was less interested in being your friend. Okay, So there isn't parity in those relationships. Balanced relationships usually are those relationships we have over a long period of time, face-to-face -face kinds of relationships, like partner relationships in a marriage, for example, or friendship, good friend relationships. Um, if you have these balanced relationships in your life, often they're the primary relationships, what they tend to do is take up a lot of your time. They become the primary f source of your social attention. And that tends to create, according to Blau, unbalanced relationships elsewhere in our life. So what happens then is that we have limited resources to invest in our total number of relationships. And that's a bit of a, a sad thing to realize, but we're all finite creatures. So if you put balance into your primary relationships and you have other types of relationships with people, maybe friendships or not, uh, you might work a lot less hard than they do to keep that relationship alive. There's also an uh, idea of the principle of marginal utilities. Uh, and this is a term from the previous slide, points of satiation regarding goods and services. So uh, here it says, too much of a good thing may not be a good thing. Um, repeated uh, profits from the same kind of exchange have declining value. And this is related back to that example of the flowers from the previous slide. If a man gives his partner or wife flowers once in a while, it seems to have a, a good response, but if it's regularly happening, uh, that excitement may taper off and it may become just a normal thing, so there isn't much value or good in that service. Uh, and what becomes a little scary to think about with this is that if you apply it to your own life, intermittently rewarding someone becomes something that people seek to uh, receive that reward more than if they know they're going to get the reward every time. So occasionally bringing uh, gifts to people will be um, seen as something good. If you do it all the time, you're not going to get good bang for your buck. Blau also points out two norms associated with social exchange, uh, the norm of reciprocity and the norm of fair exchange. Reciprocity is fairly easy to understand. Reciprocal relationships, one of the most basic ideas of this comes from the Bible, do unto others as you would have others do unto you, the golden rule. So this is something people know intuitively before even encountering the idea. And so reciprocation is, as Kenneth Allen says, central in exchange. It's um, something where it develops trust. It's a basic building block for trust. I give to you, you give to me. And that also connects with this second norm of fair exchange. The idea here is that there's honesty in exchange, there isn't fraud. And the expectation of fairness is going to increase the length of the exchange relation. If I went to, say for example, a restaurant and I didn't feel like I got a fair amount of food for the price that I paid, I won't return. Okay, So these are two norms that people have for exchange relationships. There's also a discussion of 
exchange principles of power. And the summary statement for this is that social actors achieve power through unequal exchange. And there are four factors um, in social exchange where you see inequalities being determined. One is the level of exchange capital, the number of potential source alternatives. Are there other ways for this person to get what they want besides through an exchange with you, for example? The willingness and ability to use force, which I hope is self-explanatory, and consistency in value hierarchy. So this one is a little bit more abstract, and I suggest looking at Kenneth Allen to figure this out. There are a lot of explanations that he gives that might clarify it for you. Our third theorist under exchange theory is Randall Collins, who I mentioned before also theorized about conflict. So he's got some different interests within social theory. One of the things that he contributes to this understanding is emotion to understanding exchange. And in particular, there are some funny things about human beings. How can exchange theory, for example, account for what's called altruism? Altruism means you give without any expectation of return. Uh, if, for example, you see someone on the street who's homeless and you decide out of compassion to give them a $20 bill, you don't expect that person necessarily to do anything for you, just take the money and they might just say thank you or not. But that's altruism. You do something for someone without any expectation of return. How can we use exchange theory to explain that? It doesn't seem to make sense in terms of the utility calculus that we discussed earlier with Jeremy Bentham. And this is another question Collins raises. How often do people really calculate or gauge interactions by rational principles? How much of our everyday interaction with people is rationally based enlightenment ideas that we talked about, you know, reason and rationality, um, and how much of it is rooted in emotions, right, feelings that you get. So you can ask, is there a common medium or metric for exchange, or is it really something that may vary a lot by individual or by the groups that an individual associate with, associates with and learns from? Collins points out uh, something and he creates a term for it, this notion of interaction ritual chains. And you can think of these, for example, uh, if you're religious. If you've gone to church or to some type of religious ceremony, you see these. Uh, so think about a religious ceremony you've gone to and you'll realize there was bodily co-presence. People physically in the same room with each other bodily co-presence, people together. Religion, religious ceremonies, also have barriers to outsiders. There's a familiarity that someone has with the religious ritual that allows those who are in the know to perform the ritual and those who aren't in the know or don't know what to do to feel left out or like they can't participate. Also, too, in religious ceremonies, you note there's a mutual focus of attention. This idea of we're saying a prayer together, or we're singing a song together, or we are um, doing some type of blessing, for example. And with that, finally, you see a shared emotional mood. So rituals are sequenced patterns of behavior, and these all work together within the um, idea of ritual chains, interaction ritual chains. There are three types of cultural capital that we can also talk about. And cultural capital is um, it's an interesting idea. It means this notion that we have ideas that have value and that allow us to operate in different arenas of our culture. So, for example, in sociology, I have a lot of cultural capital. I know a lot about my discipline. And if, for example, I go abroad, then I'm seen as having a lot of cultural capital as an American. I know about America. 
and these are the kinds of things that allow us to participate in some groups and not necessarily in other groups. So let's go through some types of cultural capital. Generalized cultural capital. Collins is describing this. An individual's stock of symbols that are associated with group identity. So as an example in Alan's book, there are two people who see each other and they both are wearing tie-dye t-shirts. They have generalized cultural capital because they recognize each other's symbols as bringing them together through something like, for example, the music of the Grateful Dead. Um, Kenneth Allen says they're both deadheads. Um, they have a shared focus of um, attention and they engage in each other in interaction because of this general cultural capital that they share. You can have particularized cultural capital. This one is fun because what happens is you can think of like for example a friend you've had who you share really a, an inside joke with and that becomes particular cultural capital that you two share that other people aren't really going to get. I'll give you one example from my life. I went to a film with a friend of mine, a documentary, and during that film there was someone in the audience who constantly was talking to herself seemingly, responding to the film. She was going, huh, hmm, oh, huh, over and over. And so my friend and I would just stare at each other like, can you believe this is happening? And so after the film and for months afterwards, uh, we've had this running joke where sometimes we'll talk about some fact or something and one of us will start going, ha, huh, and the other will go, hmm, and the other will go, ha, huh, and we'll have this particularized cultural capital. We have a, an exchange basis for, you know, closeness and feeling of proximity based on this shared experience. Reputational, well, that was a bad line. Let's try again. Reputational cultural capital is this idea of sometimes people know something about you um, and that means that they're more likely to engage you in conversation than if you're a complete stranger. So for example if someone's read a book of mine on homelessness there are emails I get sometimes from people who want to know more about that and that's a cultural capital that's based on reputation. Collins notes that human beings are unique for having cultural capital and those three ways that he discussed it and that we look for market opportunities. So markets are, are places where you can exchange goods and services, right? And we try to increase our cultural capital. Most people want to have different circles that they can interact with and participate in. But there's a paradox in that we also try to avoid situations where our lack of cultural capital will be apparent. And a good example of this is um, if, for example, here it says, um, if you go to a conference and you don't know about um, some minor topic that's going on within the room, you might fall silent uh, and not participate for fear of showing your ignorance. So this is something where human beings do impression management, you could say, really based on their market opportunities. And we constantly want to gain cultural capital, but don't want to feel foolish while we do. Two dimensions of stratification, vertical and horizontal. I always think of vertical as like this, and horizontal is the horizon. Horizons are flat, so that helps me to remember. Vertical up and down, you've got three different things going on. The principle of ritual coercion. Okay, This means that people at the top have power and can coerce, coerce you to do things. There's the principle of anticipatory socialization, or bottom-up. And what that means is that people who are at the very bottom of an institution, they try to figure out what those people 
want as you enacting a role. So that's anticipatory socialization. You're trying to determine what other people will want you to do so that you can fulfill that role. The principle of the bureaucratic personality is between those two, and I think of myself as embodying this to some extent. I have people who are coercive toward me, get this done now, you have to do this, and then I'm also coercing other people, and they are trying to socialize. So there's a little bit of socialization I'm doing, anticipatory socialization, but I'm also coercing people who are below me. So a person who's kind of in between is more of a bureaucratic personality. Again, horizons flat, so the horizontal dimension of networks is something to consider. The density of a network varies by frequency and longevity of interactions. So if you have many frequent interactions with people and they're over a good period of time, that is considered a very dense network. And those kinds of networks promote homogeneity. They're not very diverse, right? If people are ritually seeing each other over and over and over again for long periods of time and doing the same kind of thing, they're going to become similarly minded. So they're not very diverse, they tend to be homogeneous, and they create high levels of social conformity. Your network really informs how you end up seeing the world, right? The people around you influence who you are. And to that extent, you can think of a, a very uh, interesting notion that the self is a product of your social interaction, something we talked a bit about with George Herbert Mead. The individual and the society are never really separate. There's a back and forth between them. You don't, to some extent, and this is a wild idea to consider, you don't have a self inside you. The self is a function, a product of relationships.